Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, for the millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Corporate and political power brokers with access to Washington framed big oil and Christianity as the twin pillars of American exceptionalism in the modern age. While initially these two concepts may not seem interconnected, a recent book makes the case that oil and Christianity came together in America. Anointed with Oil, How Christianity and Crude Made Modern America chronicles this story and teaches us valuable lessons for the now. Today, we get to speak with the author. Darren Dochuk is an associate professor of history at the University of Notre Dame. He has authored a few books and is a renowned historian. Darren, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Justin. Great to be with you and great to be with you and Lance. And of course, we couldn't begin this critical conversation without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years. Here is your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. I really enjoyed the way you broke it down into the, the big oil barons and the, the wildcatters and then brought in the religious aspects of all of it. And hopefully you're going to get to share much of that with our listeners today. So I won't take up too much time, but it's uh, nice to meet you and looking forward to our discussion today. Thanks, Lance. Nice to meet you. So for most Americans, the rise of oil and Christianity probably don't go hand in hand. Those things don't immediately come to mind. Uh, when you think of one or the other. Yet your book, Darren, makes the connection that these two topics are interwoven. Why should anyone in modern America care about the history of oil and Christianity? Well, I, I think there are several reasons. I'll just share a couple. And I guess the most obvious uh, is the most current. Uh, I think an interwoven history of oil uh, and religion helps shed fresh light on very current debates over energy and environment. Uh, debates that we know are so not just politically heated, but but morally charged. Uh, and they're particularly charged and heated uh, on the continent's oil patches, uh, be it Texas and Oklahoma or Alaska, even Alberta, Canada, uh, where citizens have come to see pipelines and oil rigs uh, as godly imperatives, at least many citizens in the oil patches of North America. So uh, in my book, I use the term anointed. I use it in different ways. Uh, but to designate, for instance, the ways in which the United States uh, and its citizens have sacralized uh, petroleum uh, and, and deemed it their divine uh, destiny. And I, I show that at multiple levels uh, and try to track the various ideological and institutional ramifications of that belief across time. The lowest altitude at which I work is the oil patch. And this is perhaps the facet of the book that uh, interests me most. Uh, we know that in the oil patches of North America, there is a sense of regional exceptionalism, uh, one that is legitimated uh, in theological as well as political terms. Oil and religion in those places, in fact, reinforce another force, uh, reinforce one another rather uh, with particular intent uh, and also with intensity. Uh, so in my book, for instance, I show how oil has long facilitated uh, the institutional structures uh, of religion in the oil patch. Churches are built with oil money, mega churches, colleges, uh, and in turn, uh, you know, helped fund the cultural apparatus. Uh, in return, uh, those religious folk who populate the oil patch uh, will naturally legitimize and defend the wishes of the oil man because of these deep institutional and ideological uh, connections. So is it any wonder then uh, that the fight over oil in these regions, the right to drill, uh, the right to protect it as a key energy source uh, is so morally charged. And, and my book, again, uh, tracks that long history uh, of politics uh, and religion. Secondly, and here I, I cut really to the highest altitude, uh, the, the more kind of broader survey of the book, and that is the way in which an interwoven uh, history of Christianity and crude also sheds fresh light on this nation's uh, shifting position in the world. Uh, anointed in this term, uh, demonstrates how oil and religion together drove the engines of American global expansion uh, and also really framed uh, that ascent uh, and the nation's imperial project uh, in sacred terms. Uh, the book begins in the 1860s, the discovery of oil, uh, and immediately, uh, you know, America's possession of this valuable resource uh, allowed it to kind of envision its future 
uh, mythologize and, and theologize its future uh, as if this was providential. Uh, and this kind of imagining of oil as America's destiny uh, would have real uh, political impact in the 20th century. The very notion of an American century, for instance, the notion that the United States should take the lead in global development uh, was in many ways framed by and, and uh, pursued by uh, oilmen uh, who aligned with missionaries, statesmen, uh, engineers, uh, churches, petroleum companies, all to kind of forward American economic development uh, across the globe, but also to ordain it really as, as, as divinely sanctioned. Uh, so this, this allegorical power of petroleum was, was very potent, uh, helped provide a narrative of American authority on an international stage, helped frame a narrative of American exceptionalism uh, that I argue would last right into the 1970s, at which point the energy crisis uh, would kind of force the nation uh, to recognize kind of a new reality uh, on an international stage. And finally, there's a third way in which an interwoven history of oil and Christianity uh, provides a glimpse at some of the divisions uh, in American life, especially American corporate and church life. Uh, these divisions have shaped profoundly uh, the way in which modern American capitalism and religion have developed uh, over the last century, century and a half. And, and we can talk more about that uh, uh, a little later. I, I have to admit um, that when I first read the title of your book, the concept of these two topics, oil and Christianity, was um, somewhat of a, a new idea for me. You mentioned in the book that um, this took years in the making, that, that you kind of tossed this idea around for a long time. Um, why now and how did you ultimately come to the decision um, to tackle this topic? Yes, I have been living with this for a while, so uh, I, I was uh – thrilled to, to see it published and to see it out. Uh, so it really was a, a lot of fun to write. Uh, the origins of the project, I guess, is both professional and personal. Uh, I, you know, I published a, a book back in uh, 2011 called uh, From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, Plain Folk Religion, Grassroots Politics, and the Rise of the Evangelical Conservatism. And that really uh, was a story of kind of the migration of Texans and Oklahomans uh, to Southern California in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, of course, many of them deeply devout evangelicals who brought their Baptist and Pentecostal faiths and populist politics with them to Southern California and then helped uh, kind of fuel the rise of, of conservatives, of the conservative political movement there led by Barry Goldwater and, of course, Ronald Reagan. So uh, while doing that book, researching it, every corner I turned, it seemed there was either a church or a derrick. Uh, and I also was coming across numerous uh, kind of oil men who were very influential both in uh, church life, uh, in funding it, and also in uh, helping mobilize this grassroots conservatism. So it occurred to me at the time, wait a second, what if we put these two entities together, uh, religion and oil, uh, what can we say about American, modern American society? And early on, I, I thought I would simply follow the money. Uh, I, I knew how much oil capital had flowed into American Christianity throughout the 20th century, uh, supporting its missions, uh, supporting its missionaries abroad, its churches. Uh, and so I thought, OK, th this is where to start. And as I started uh, traveling down that path, other questions opened up to me. Again, thinking about how oil uh, helped kind of frame America's sense of, of supremacy, of authority on a global stage. Uh, and then also uh, turning to the oil patch itself and, and just exploring how is it? How does life, uh, how does work, but how does worship also uh, be something different on an oil patch? Notions of capital, of risk, of time uh, tied to the boom bust economy. All of this, again, shaped religious life, I think, in distinctive ways. Uh, and I, I would say that that, as I mentioned earlier, that's really the angle of the book that excites me most. And that's perhaps because of the Second factor here, and that's personal experience. I grew up in Alberta, Canada, uh, where there's just a bit of oil and evangelicalism. And uh, it occurred to me that, hey, this is a chance to kind of revisit my roots. I grew up in the 1980s, which was a very vulnerable time for oil. And I saw how concerns over oil and oil politics penetrated church life and, and how church life in turn stirred up populist protest and political action uh, around this, this core issue, this commodity of oil. So uh, as with most both book projects, uh, you know, it was a combination of personal reference and, 
and scholarly lines of questioning that kind of led me down this path. And uh, again, it's a path that uh, I enjoy traveling. Evangelicals in America's oil country occupy a privileged position in politics, especially right-wing politics. From the Tea Party to several modern Republican presidents, and from East Texas to Israel, what's the biggest impact been on our modern political landscape? Great question. Well, and you're right, evangelicals and evangelicalism have uh, enjoyed uh, outsized importance uh, and power in America's oil country. And, and my book is sets out to explain why is that by paying closer attention to petroleum uh, and evangelicalism's proximity to uh, and profiting from it. Uh, what, what do we, how do we typically approach the history of the modern right or the modern religious right? Well, so often, uh, usually the case is we, we focus on social politics, abortion, reproduction, gender. And, and of course, all of that is absolutely vital. Uh, but from the 1970s to the present day, I argue that petroleum has always been, uh, and energy more broadly has always been, uh, every bit as important to evangelicals living in the oil patch. Uh, Ronald Reagan in 1980, quite, you know, famously, of course, with his platform of Let's Make America Great Again, traveled through Texas visiting uh, preachers as well as petroleum executives, many of whom attended the same churches, uh, and there promised the nation uh, that he would make it great again by uh, letting the wildcatters, the independent oil men of the region, uh, kind of open up new frontiers uh, we, you know, we must remove government obstacles to energy production, he would declare. Uh, and this resonated with evangelicals in the pews, uh, just as much as his calls for, you know, uh, in terms of anti-abortion and other social conservative policies resonated with them as well. So my, the point of my book was not to differentiate necessarily what the biggest political impact oil patch evangelicalism has had on modern politics. But what I do want to say is that the impact has been more widely and profoundly felt uh, than we usually think. We've been talking with Darren Dochuk, the author of Anointed with Oil, How Christianity and Crude Made Modern America, about the integral role oil and Christianity play in politics. But a number of questions still remain. How did we get here? And what lessons can we learn from the past? To find out, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Oil and Christianity have been framed as the twin pillars of American exceptionalism by power brokers. We're speaking with Darren Dochuk, an associate professor of history at the University of Notre Dame, about the significance of Christianity and oil's interwoven history. Next, we're going to look back to understand how we arrived at where we are now. Throughout the book, it's, um, it doesn't matter where we're in, whether we're in Canada, the United States, or the Middle East, many people looked at um, crude oil as a gift from God. Now, when many people read this, they might initially think that this was, you know, more anecdotal than, than literal. But as you, as I read the book, in reality, many people truly view um, oil as a literal gift from God. Um, how did this direct their lives and businesses? And you, you, you briefly touched on it, but I'd like for you to go into a little bit more detail. You know, of course, on one hand, this kind of God talk uh, can be purely pragmatism or a matter of expediency. Uh, you know, considering oil a gift of God, their work divinely sa sanctioned, uh, oil men can easily justify their actions, uh, exploitative ones as well. And that, of course, has happened across time. And uh, I make plenty of room for those types of that type of use of such language. Uh, there is evidence, for instance, in the countless oil companies that were started up uh, by church folk and uh, or, or executives who would, you know, take advantage of entire congregations. They would uh, get their congregations to invest. Some of these companies were run by preachers uh, and then they would often fail. So there's a way in which, of course, this is anecdotal and it's manipulative. Uh, but as you say, the subjects I write about and really I'm the most interested in are those executives and managers uh, who are very sincere in their beliefs and, and utterly, literally uh, convinced that God had bestowed this gift on them so they could change the world. Uh, you know, on one side of the equation, for instance, are these independent oil men that I highlight, uh, those wildcatters who were, you know, kind of uh, forced out of Pennsylvania by the Rockefellers, came to hate the Rockefellers and Standard Oil and established themselves in the Southwest, uh, California, Texas, and, and there they started their own uh, 
very powerful companies. Lyman Stewart, for instance, of Union Oil is an example, and J. Howard Pugh of Sunoco. Uh, these two these two individuals and, and, and kind of oil families uh, are the essence really of kind of modern day evangelicalism. They truly believe that they had to save the world by saving individuals for Christ. Uh, they poured their monies into uh, the construction of schools and churches. Uh, they also they also impose kind of biblical principles on their own kind of corporate uh, structures and 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 uh, 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 workings uh, in the marketplace. J. Howard Pugh was known, for instance, to uh, preach sermons at the Christmas annual Christmas party. Uh, he expected his employees to adhere to Christian ethics. Uh, his family was known to sponsor revivals. So, uh, you know, whether it was in his boardroom in Philadelphia, uh, or out on the road, uh, supporting evangelical causes, uh, pouring his funds into uh, such things as Christianity today. J. Howard Pugh, uh, like Lyman Stewart, uh, kind of lived day to day immersed, uh, in this, this ethic, uh, in this belief that, uh, his money, his oil money, uh, was meant for godly purposes and he was going to do all he could to change the nation and change society according to biblical beliefs. The moral imperative many of these individuals felt, as you've explained, uh, really inform their every decision. However, just because their intentions may have been pure doesn't mean that the end result actually worked out all that well for society. So on the whole, do you feel that Christian oil moguls were more captains of industry who improve society or robber barons behind hiding behind veils of purity and purpose? Well, I, I guess I try to nudge readers to a conclusion that somewhere in the middle, and this is the, uh, the historian in me talking here, uh, the oil men I write about were generally earnest and in many ways well-meaning, uh, and, and the world they sought to create would, in their estimation, be better. Uh, but as your question suggests, uh, the outcomes were not always to their liking uh, or beneficent or beneficial uh, for the people and societies uh, in which they played out. Uh, I could cite one example here. It's not necessarily talking about one particular oil baron. Uh, but it is talking about, uh, it, it's referencing a, a very powerful oil executive by the name of William Eddy. And he figures prominently in my story, uh, particularly as the tale takes us from uh, the American Southwest to the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, especially. Now, you know, William Eddy was born in the Middle East to missionaries. Uh, he was very devoted uh, to improving and developing the Middle East in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and it's in that vein that he came to work for Aramco, which, as we know now, is the largest company in the world, the most profitable company. At the time, it was owned by a number of American oil companies. And it was up to Eddie, in part, in no small part, to, to make this company kind of committed to uh, the development of Saudi Arabia uh, as a whole. And he took this charge very seriously, coming from his own kind of deep Protestant beliefs. Uh, Saudi Aramco, for instance, constructed this whole apparatus really of kind of religious ecumenism uh, right on uh, in the, the camps uh, and right on the uh, on the drill sites themselves, trying to uh, encourage ecumenism, encourage education, cultural education, uh, in, encourage interaction. So there's a way in which his own kind of moral vision was imposed on uh, the day-to-day uh, -day operations of Aramco. Uh, now, of course, even as Eddie and Aramco carried out this mission of kind of uplifting uh, Saudi Arabia as a whole through the oil that it was uh, profiting from, uh, Aramco, of course, was also committing a range of sins in the name of development, privileging white labor over non-white labor, for instance, which uh, resulted in uh, labor unrest, uh, settling its white workers in middle class enclaves while forcing Arab workers to live in third tier shacks, uh, lobbying for a Saudi royal family that imposed its will with blunt force. So that's the darker side. Uh, and so, you know, much like the rest of the oil men and, and oil executives in my story, uh, the picture is clouded and complicated, uh, but that's what makes for good history. And, and I think it's how history should be written. And um, you mentioned too, that Eddie worked with um, multiple presidents in establishing U S policy in Saudi Arabia and with Saudi Arabia because of the importance that oil was going to have on the growth of the United States after World War II. For sure. No, that's a, it's also a fascinating uh, kind of 
angle. It's a fascinating uh, kind of range of influence that Eddie and his peers at Aramco, who who were part of what was called the Arabian Affairs Division, again, facilitating cross-cultural education. And and they also begged uh, President Eisenhower to uh, kind of form a moral alliance of kind of linking America to the Arab world through kind of a shared respect for monotheism. Uh, and Eisenhower, of course, uh, took a liking to this, at least initially. This was a way in which the United States could ensure its influence in the Middle East and forge these bonds of union with Arab Muslim oil producing nations. And, and so Eddie and, and uh, his, his peers at Aramco, uh, many of whom were coming from missionary backgrounds, were absolutely at the forefront of this political move. You've mentioned him just briefly, but I, I think we'd be remiss, especially as an old high school history teacher, in our discussion of oil in the United States, if we didn't mention um, John D. Rockefeller. And there obviously is plenty to say. And in your book, you talk about him and his entire family, uh, children, grandchildren, and the work that they have done. But we're going to ask you one question about it. And that is, did Rockefeller, um, that he, se- he seemed to believe that he had been endowed by God to, to pave better roads for society. Um, do you think that he, and I'll kind of open it up, do you think he and his family have fulfilled that prophecy that he kind of had for himself or or do you think they've fallen a little short of what the old old man mm-hmm. Rockefeller would have wanted were he uh, you know alive right. 100 years later and looking at what his family had accomplished with the oil money there again you're 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 making me take a stand here and I'm I'm the one who always kind of waffles or tries to provide a complicated <laughs> well, I, I, as an old history teacher, I know that. That's why I, I thought, well, I've got him here. I'll, I'll ask him and see uh, if he, if he sure. will or not, because I know that's exactly we history teachers want our students to decide for themselves. But sure, no, it's a, it's a, it's obviously it's a important question, and I think Rockefeller Senior, no doubt, saw himself as uniquely endowed. Uh, talked on more than one occasion about the way that God had given him the right and privilege to make money, lots of money. Uh, he saw himself, uh, he saw his company as kind of a missionary of light, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, there's no doubt that he was kind of driven by that strong belief and it, it showed up in his business. Uh, it also showed up in his theology and in his, his theology of charity right from the beginning. He, he made lots of money. He also poured lots of money. Uh, into several causes, you know, ranging from the YMCA to missionaries in China to the University of Chicago, of which he gave millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but of course, with proximity to unlimited power uh, came, uh, again, sins of his own making, you know, stamping out the competition, destroying the careers and lives of thousands of oil producers, uh, imposing standards will on governments uh, and societies around the globe. Uh, so, you know, his was an unapologetic take, uh, no prisoners approach, you know, take no prisoners approach, uh, cutthroat, uh, an ethic that he helped implant in American capitalism. So, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to, to judge him. I think perhaps the question's worth answering, uh, with Rockefeller's son also in mind. Uh, Rockefeller Jr. would, you know, take the lead in his family's charitable endeavor, uh, more than his father. He saw oil and oil profits as principal means. Uh, of developing the globe. And so what happens? Uh, he creates the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, the main aim, quite literally, was to advance the civilizations of peoples uh, around the world, uh, to, to promote the well-being of mankind throughout the world. And I, it, you know, in, in measuring uh, the Rockefeller legacy, uh, I think John uh, Rockefeller Jr.'s legacy uh is, is more definitive, uh, I think, perhaps to answer the question of whether or not Rockefeller met his promise to pave uh, better roads for society. Uh, you know, that, that's a more mixed record. Uh, but it is his son, I think, who more de- definitively fulfilled uh, the family prophecy. Good answer. I, thank you very much for attempting that. I appreciate that. As, as an old history teacher, I appreciate <laughs> that. I think you did a nice job with that. It would be difficult to have this conversation, as Lance mentioned, without at least a, a mention of the Rockefeller family. And I, I like your take there on this idea that, you know, perhaps it's better not for us today to look back and try to to make a firm judgment on them because um, it, it's really hard to know. And I think that's the case with a lot of these people when you talk about these ingrained beliefs uh, from a distance and looking back, you know, it, it, it can be difficult for us to accurately um you know, really pass judgment on them because hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But uh, 
in, in this in this case, they didn't they didn't have that benefit of knowing what we know now. They were doing things and developing industries that didn't exist really. Um, so they were paving unpaved roads. Well, I think it's also interesting to note that you know the fourth generation Rockefellers are now uh, among the leaders of kind of alternative energy and environmental causes. And on one hand, that is you know an implicit critique of their forefather who built this industry. Uh, but at the same time, how do they remember uh, their forefather? It's by emphasizing his entrepreneurialism. And it's that very sense of entrepreneurialism that they say is needed uh, to build a, kind of an alternative energy industry. Well, it's taking some of the, it is interesting because it's kind of taking supposedly what mattered most to Rockefeller and and using that as our justification, right, for moving forward, which is that kind of that we know the way and we know how to help society and that's what we're going to do. And now that there's a different way to help society, a better way, that's the way we're going to go. Uh, how can we use these lessons in our modern society and how might these observations better inform our opinion of our elected officials? Well, that's what Lance and I will discuss in the next segment of the show. Darren, we enjoyed your book and appreciate you taking some time to speak with Lance and me. I enjoyed it too. Thanks for having me, Justin and Lance. Darren Dochuk is the author of Anointed with Oil, How Christianity and Crude Made Modern America, which you can purchase by visiting thestateofus.org or anywhere books are found. How can we use the lessons of Anointed with Oil in our modern society, and how might these observations better inform our opinion of our elected officials? To find out, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Anointed with Oil, How Christianity and Crude Made Modern America. What a name for a book, Lance. We got to speak with an associate professor of history at the University of Notre Dame, who's the author of the book. That's Darren Dochek. And uh, he shared with us some insight on it. But boy, there was a lot we didn't get to talk about, right? Because, I mean, this is... Uh, you, you put the notes in there and it's like a 600 page book. He, he went back to the Pennsylvania days in the 1850s all the way to modern times. So he's covering quite a time span as well as a, a very interesting two topics. You know, I mean, you could have just done a book on oil over that time period or a book on Christianity. And he kind of sells it a little short in the title because he does get into the Middle East <clears throat> and a lot about Islam and, and the and the Muslim religion and and its effect on things and in the um, and the Jewish religion the Jewish faith as far as Israel coming in so there's a lot here I mean there are just just very quickly there are the four parts in the book right uh, called crude awakenings the carbon gospels the petro wars and crude reckonings and as we talked about off air you could have taken each one of those and made this a four volume book. So um, it's very interesting how he started from the beginning all the way to present day and covered everything in great detail. I mean, he just mentioned, you know, Lyman Stewart, the Pews and the Rockefellers and a little bit about Eddie. But there are multiple other and I'll say characters, you know, um, in the story here, um, real life characters that were very inter interesting to read and a lot of. Um, anecdotal evidence about the different topics and about the different discoveries of oil and um, going into the offshore oil industry, um, talking about fracking and where he comes from um, in Alberta, the oil sands, you know, which is now the Keystone Pipeline kind of stuff, you know, and um, the growth of some of these port cities and California and its oil. And it's just, it's amazing um, you know, in Africa where they're looking for oil and, um, you know, the Middle East and, uh, and then, and they bring in the religion and the missionaries and how the Rockefellers wanted to open up China. Right. We're all over the place. So when you look at it, yes, it's, you know, almost 600 pages of reading over 600 with the notes, but with what he's trying to cover, he does a great job of keeping you interested. I mean, we talked about that as well. It's like, man, are we going to finish this in time? And then once you pick it up, it reads rather quickly. You know, there, there are enough stories in it that it doesn't read like a really 
It doesn't read as a dry book at all. You get to know the, the people involved and you want to know what's driving their decisions and what's going to happen next. So it's kind of an, it's an interesting read, even though it's a very historical read. To Darren's credit, the author of the book, uh, as Lance pointed out, for a history book, it reads remarkably well. And that is something that Lance and I've had a couple on the show where that's not necessarily the case. It's not that they're not interesting, but they're definitely probably not something that the, uh, you know, that your everyday American is going to just pick up and, and really dive into because uh, there's so much to take in and they're more written in a scholarly fashion. And it's not to say that this isn't well-written or well-researched because it is, but I think as Lance pointed out, it's more, it's certainly more approachable. And I think that's essential given the length of the book, because as you could imagine, if this was written the way that some books like this are written, uh, boy, it could be hard to get through. But, but I mean, let's look at it, whether you come at it from an economic standpoint, you know, look at, and look at where we are with oil right now, you know, with the prices bottoming out and there's an oil glut and how it's going to affect and is affecting uh, politics in these countries who depend on oil, either um, A, for for it to run their countries or B, to make money to build the infrastructure and political stability and the impact this is going to have. I mean, it's a very timely, timely book as well, or you can come at it from the standpoint of someone who is interested in um, religion and, you know, the, the, the power of religion on the history of the world, which is a fascinating topic in and of itself. I mean, whether you're a believer or not, and it doesn't matter what your religion is, you can't argue that religion hasn't played a major role in the development of mankind in the 19th and 20th and now into the 21st century. And this book kind of takes all of that and puts it together. So, and takes you from, you know, the point in the mid 1850s to the present day and follows. We didn't even really talk about um, you know, he talked a little bit about, you know, the right wing, but he he makes the the connection of how the Tea Party grew out of all of this, how it grew out of the Texas oil fields and the um, conservative religious base that's there, and the political power brothers and you know the Koch brothers in in, in modern times and the belief in free enterprise. I mean, there's just a plethora of angles that you as the reader can come at this and and gain some insight. Like Lance said, there's a lot of different ways you can approach this from an interest standpoint. The book covers a lot of different angles because these, and, and as Darren pointed out during our discussion with him, so much of this history is not always as clean cut, I think, as sometimes we believe it to be. It's it's muddier than we like to think that it is. And I think this book helps illustrate that because there's so many components that go into it. So when you talk about a big takeaway, it's like, well, you know, you could list 10 big takeaways. But the one that stuck out to me, the one I think that our listeners have to be the most aware of is this idea, right, that as we talked about, so many of these people came at it with these with these pure motivations, right, or, or this earnest and well-meaning intention. Uh, but in reality, what's happened in modern day politics is power brokers have taken advantage of that well-meaning intent to use it for their ends to control people, to control politicians, to buy off politicians. And so I think that that illumination um, uh, of this narrative is so important in today's society because when we talk about how we're divided, I think it's important to remember that a lot of those divisions are not accidental. They are they are intentional and they are being, those wedges are being driven on purpose uh, by these power brokers, you know, who who want to protect their interests, who don't have your best interest in mind. They're not like some of these people that started in this field where they got into it, you know, again, whether or not you agree with them, they got into it because they felt it was a, uh, you know, anointed uh, purpose that they had. They they were the ones to to do this, especially when you look at some of Rockefeller's motivations and how he approached it. So to me, Lance, that was that was kind of the big thing because it's like, wow, that's you know, it's so important to keep in mind when you're thinking about who are you electing and why are they there, right? How did they get there and and who wants them there? Um, because so often we don't ask those questions, and I think that's part of 
you know, it started out one way, but it kind of has morphed into this total, uh, this total game of power that is played across the world, not just in the United States. Well, I liked what you said about that history is not as clean cut as what we remember in our two or three sentences about people, that it is a lot muddier. And when you talk about around the world, it did a lot. In, and I've studied it and, and been interested about the Middle East, going back to Roosevelt at the end of World War II, to Truman, to Eisenhower's four pillars of faith that trying to get everybody to work together. And then people want to, you know, if you want to find out why Saudi Arabia is such a major player in the United States today, he covers that history from, you know, the end of World War II to the present day. And you wonder, you know, how can we overlook this and why don't we stand up to the Saudis a little tougher? Well, that's fine. Again, read the book and understand what the ramifications would be of that. And it's not that it, anybody's wrong, you know, because I'm in his, in uh, Darren's uh, realm of, as a historian, I don't want to put anybody's thoughts in their mind, but you start to see why everybody tiptoes around things. But as you said, that point about history being um, a little muddier, you know, that it's not as clear cut. But, you know, here at True Chat, we do all of this, right? Because um, and I think we did a great job today with Darren's help to educate people by providing honest, open and respectful conversations. I mean, as our mission statement, we did that today. You know, and hopefully some of these conversations will help you get interest in the book and pick up the book and read it and then have a better understanding of why decisions are going to, going to be made. Not necessarily that you have to agree with those decisions, but at least you start to understand why decisions have been made in history the way they have. And do we need to now make some different decisions? Right. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the that's the thing that you learn as you start to read more of these books. It's not uh, it's not as perfect or as clean as we like to believe that it is. And and the more informed you are about these things, the better decisions you can make. And hopefully, one of those decisions you'll make, Lance, right, is uh, helping us accomplish our mission because. Uh, this show is unlike anything else out there, and, and we're trying to include more people in the conversation because that's how we get these honest, open, and respectful conversations. So uh, this is a syndicated radio program. It's a podcast. So there's a lot of different ways to tune in. But Lance, if some of our listeners want to invite their neighbors, friends, family to tune in, right, what are some of the ways they could invite them to do that? Well, you get them turned on to podcasts and you can find us at uh, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else fine podcasts are found. And that's on Tuesday and Thursday. And then check your radio dial for the, syn the syndicated radio show in your area. And as always, you can purchase a copy of today's book if you'd like. Darren Dochuk, again, thank you to him for being on at thestateofus.org. We've got other books there, articles and resources, so be sure to check it out. For The State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch. And as always, thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in, thestateofus.org.